Colossians chapter 3, if you're a guest of ours, we just finished up a series of messages entitled Monsters Within, Overcoming Debilitating Emotions. But here in Colossians, we're kind of getting back to our regularly scheduled program, just going verse by verse through this awesome letter written by Paul the Apostle. And Paul in chapter 3 really has challenged you and I as followers of Jesus. And just by way of reminder, he has told us that we have been rescued out of darkness. We've been put into the marvelous light of the Lord Jesus Christ. And as a result now, we have this new self, right? Our old self has died. We have a new self now, a brand new closet that we can get dressed from, where we put on love and compassion and kindness and forgiveness. We put on these new outfits, and we live our lives to the glory of God. Here's what we know according to Scripture. When you came to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, your relationship with God was made right. But as a result of that relationship being made right, you now have an opportunity to see all of your other relationships made right as the Holy Spirit within you empowers you to actually love them as God loves them. So what I would say to you this morning is that following Jesus is not just for you on Sunday mornings when you show up to church. Following Jesus affects every single aspect of your life. Following Jesus affects every single relationship in your life. And this morning, according to this scripture that we're going to look at, we're going to see that the Lord is going to walk right into your front door. He's going to look right at your marriages, and the Spirit of God is going to speak a word to every single wife in the building and every single husband in the building. And before you leave today, you're going to have an opportunity to see just a quick little snapshot of what God desires for marriage. Now, here's the reality. If you're here today and you are married, you chose an awesome day to come to church. Amen? Now, if you're not married, here's the reality. One day, you probably want to be married. And that's why you're on FarmersOnly.com every weekend, right? But anyway, so you have this desire to be married. So what God... Are y'all with me? Y'all heard of Farmers Only, right? All right. So what God wants to do this morning is he wants to give you a glimpse into the kind of man that he wants you to be in the days ahead as a husband and the kind of wife that he wants you to be in the days ahead as a lady. So this morning, Colossians chapter 3, just two verses, verse 18 and 19, if you'll just stand with me and out of God's word this morning, you got it there in front of you, say yes. So the Bible says, wives, be subject to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. And husbands, love your wives and do not be embittered against them. Just two verses. Let's read this all together. It's on the screen on the count of three. One, two, three, go. Wives, be subject to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be embittered against them. Let's bow together. Father, thank you so much just for an opportunity to worship you as we have sung songs And now, Lord, we worship you as we listen to your divine word. God, I rest solely in the Holy Spirit of God to minister to every single heart in the building today. For those who have not yet crossed over the line of faith and come into a relationship with you, would you draw them to salvation? Would you do a work in their lives that only you can get credit for? Father, I pray for marriages as well. Lord, I know there's no doubt there are some marriages that are doing extremely well today. This message will be a source of encouragement to them. But then I'm confident, Lord, that there are some marriages that are struggling. And Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus that you would use your word like a healing balm in their lives. And God, that you would do a work, once again, that only you can get the credit for. God, open our eyes, open our ears to welcome your word into our hearts. And that's in the name of Jesus Christ that we pray. And everybody said, amen, amen. So you can be seated this morning. So what is this text teach you and I about marriage. Two things. We're going to start off by talking to the wives and then we'll talk to the husbands. So if you're a wife here today, here's what this scripture teaches. It says, wives, follow the leader that God has given to you. Follow the leader that God has given to you. Again, verse 18, the Bible says, wives, be subject to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Now the term for subject speaks of placing oneself under the leadership of another. And the language describes an intentional and continual choice of a wife where she makes the husband in her relationship the genuine leader. She's purposefully respecting and following the leadership of her husband. Now, look, submission does not mean unconditional obedience. 
No wife is commanded to submit to her husband's leadership if her husband is violating the Lord's will. But before you get bent out of shape concerning this particular word, submit, let's talk about where this word is used in other places in the scripture. The Bible tells you and I that we're commanded to submit to governmental authorities in Romans chapter 13. The church is commanded to submit to their elders in Hebrews chapter 13. As well, the same word submit or subject is used to describe the activity of all followers of Jesus in Ephesians chapter 5. As a matter of fact, the Bible says it this way, be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. And this is the idea of deferring to one another. It's an act of moving away from selfishness. In fact, it speaks of honoring others around us. The context of Colossians 3, again, is putting on the new self as a follower of Jesus. This activity changes how we relate to one another. And in our text for this morning, it deals with how a wife relates to her husband. As a wife following Jesus, you are to put on compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, and forgiveness. And as a wife, you are intentionally and continually placing yourself under the leadership of your husband. And with this activity, you're actually honoring and respecting your husband. So the question could be, what's true about following your husband? Well, just a few things that I kind of put in front of you this morning. Following your husband is actually a choice. The simple fact that it's a command given to us in the scripture shows that this is not an automatic response in the life of a wife. You have a choice to make. You're choosing to place yourself under the authority of your husband. Now this doesn't mean that you're less of a person. It doesn't mean that you're intellectually inferior. It doesn't mean that you can't take care of yourself. This is simply God's design for the marriage relationship. Just as Jesus submitted to the authority of God the Father, so you must choose to submit to the authority of your husband. There's an author by the name of Elizabeth George. Here's what she writes, listen closely. The wife decides whether or not to follow her husband. Nobody can do it for her. No one can make her do it. Her husband can't make her submit and follow. Her church can't make her. Her pastor can't make her, and neither can a counselor. She must decide to choose to defer to her husband and follow his leadership. See, following your husband is actually a choice that you make. But I'd also tell you that following your husband is a gift. Now think about that for just a moment, ladies. Respecting your husband's leadership is actually a gift to him. There's a Family Life article that gave four things that occur when you give respect as a gift to your husband. But listen to these very closely. Respect expresses a wife's trust. When you respect your husband, it magnifies your trust in his ability to lead. Respect gives a husband the belief that he can do hard things. One husband said that receiving respect from his most intimate friend, his wife, reduces his fear of failure and being inadequate. Another explained respect this way, it's like wind in my sails. No one knows me like my wife does. Her level of respect for me is a very accurate barometer of how I am doing, and my confidence to do hard things is very much connected to that. But also, respect acknowledges his leadership and discourages passivity. Giving respect shows the husband that he can be a leader in the relationship. One husband said, if wives would express love to their husbands through respect, I'm convinced that men would be better leaders and passivity would be less commonplace. But also respect provides encouragement and makes him want to love her even more. One man said that when a wife does not respect her husband enough to listen to him, he feels defeated. Another said that when his wife respects him, it makes him want to love her even more. See, honoring your husband, respecting his leadership in the marriage is a choice that you must make, and it is a gift that you choose to give. Which leads me really to another statement. Following your husband is an act of worship. So again, what's true about following your husband? It's a choice, it is a gift, but it's also an act of worship. Again, look at verse 18. The Bible says, be subject to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Literally, Paul is saying, wives, place yourself under the leadership of your husband as is proper under the authority of the one master who commands. And as a wife 
follows her husband's leadership. She's honoring God's design for marriage. This is showing respect and honor and actually worship to the Lord. Listen closely. When you follow the leadership of your husband, who you can see, it gives evidence you're following the leadership of God, whom you can't see. But a wife that rebels against, a wife that circumvents or disregards her husband is actually giving evidence that her loyalty is not with God. You know, there's a few things written in the book of Proverbs about wives that don't subject themselves to their husbands. And I figured I would just read some of these to you. Proverbs chapter 19 and verse 13 describes a contentious wife. And here's what the Bible says. The contentions of a wife are a constant dripping. Now, eyeball to eyeball, if this describes your wife, do not hit her during this moment, all right? (laughs) What is he saying here, the contentions? He's literally saying, listen, the strife, the friction, the conflict, you're always looking for an argument, always looking for stuff to gripe and complain about. If that's you, the Bible describes you, wife, as a constant dripping on your husband's head. You're driving him crazy. So the, here it, the, you know, the fact of the matter is just stop doing that. <laughs> Proverbs 20, these are going great. I've got three more. All right, so <laughs> Proverbs 21 verse nine, listen to what this scripture says. It's better to live in the corner of a roof than in the house shared with a contentious woman. Now the corner, of, have you been on your house lately, right? The corner of the roof is uh, not very secure. And in Houston, where it rains all the time, there's no doubt you'll fall off and crack your head. Are y'all listening? But the proverb writer says it's better to live like that than to live with a contentious woman. Again, a woman who is always seeking to argue, always trying to stir stuff up, always trying to make fights in the marriage. Proverbs 21 verse 19 says, it's better to live in a desert land than when a contentious and vexing woman. Proverb writer had an issue with contentious women. (laughs) What does vexing mean, right? Vexing is offensive, filled with rage and anger. So you can imagine what this would look like, right? So the husband is perhaps spending all day at work and then he really doesn't even look forward to going home. Why does he not look forward to going home? Because his vexing wife is there. It's like, oh, I gotta get myself all geared up. I gotta go see my wife. That's no way to live. But then imagine he walks into the house and as soon as he walks into the house, you immediately start griping about everything that's happened in your day. You immediately start griping about everything that he has not yet done on your honey-do list. What does the Bible say about this? The Bible says wives don't live like that. That is no way to live following your husband's leadership. As a matter of fact, when you live like that, your husband would just as soon be in a desert land, longing for water, (laughs) than to have to be around you. (laughs) This is going great, isn't it? (laughs) Oh, there's another one. (laughs) I feel like I gotta roll my sleeves up, man. Are y'all listening? I'm sweating like a dog up here. I don't know if it's the sermon topic or if it's literally just this hot. (laughs) Proverbs 27, verse 15, listen to this. A constant dripping on a day of steady rain and a contentious women are alike. Now let's just, y'all down for honesty in church, right? If this describes your wife, would you just slip your hand up real quick? I'm just kidding. (laughs) Don't do that, that'll be horrible. (laughs) So let me say it to you like this, wives, you really set the temperature in the home. Your attitude, your activity, how you respond to your husband, how you follow your husband, sets the temperature in the house. Make sure you set the temperature to a cool temperature. As a wife who follows Jesus, you don't wanna be the kind of person that's been described here. Your husband don't want you to be that kind of person. And most importantly, God purchased you with his son's blood so that you don't have to be this kind of person. 
When you came to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, you were radically changed. How you see things is different. How you think is different. How you talk is different. How you walk is different. If you're a follower of Jesus, you have the empowering presence of the Spirit of God who enables you to love your husband in a way that gives glory to God. So whenever you respect him, whenever you follow his leadership, when you make that choice, when you give that gift to him, it's actually viewed by God as an act of worship. See, when you worship here on Sunday mornings, you're lifting up your hands, you're singing your songs to the Lord as you should. But I want you to know you can also worship God in your marriage by simply following what the scriptures command. That is amazing to the Lord. Now, whoever that guy is, <laughs> he is in trouble with his wife. I'm just telling you, right? I'm preaching, he's like, glory, preach it, preacher. I bet his wife ain't even here. <laughs> I said, that's probably, that's probably more accurate. I'm just kidding, please don't stand up and say anything else. All right, God bless you. Uh, I love it. All right, wives, are y'all ready for me to talk to the husband and say yes? All right, very good. So, <laughs> I was just trying to be a gentleman, start with the ladies. All right, so here's the word to the husbands from the word. Husbands, lovingly lead your wife. Lovingly lead your wife. Now, verse 19. Husbands, love your wives. Don't be embittered against them. The message paraphrase states it this way. Husbands, go all out in your love for your wives. That's a phenomenal picture. As men, we often are encouraged to give our best, to go for it, right? To, to go all out. And typically we think about that in the sports arena or maybe even our jobs. But the Bible encourages you to put this principle to work in your marriage. When it comes to loving your wife, give your best. When it comes to loving your wife, go for it. Hold absolutely nothing back. The word love was used many times in many ways in the Greek grammar. There is eros love, which describes intimacy or a sexual passion. While sex is to be enjoyed in the context of marriage, this is not the word that Paul is using. Then there's also the word phileo. It describes a deep friendship. And while you're to be deep friends with your wife, this again is not the word that Paul is using. And then there's the word storge love. It describes a family love. You, you may have used this one before when you were like, of course I love my uncle, he's my family. Are y'all with me? This isn't the kind of love Paul is describing for your wife. Then there is agape love. This describes a radical, selfless love. This is the love that Paul says, I, as a husband, need to have for my wife. C.S. Lewis describes it as a gifting love. It's the highest form of Christian love. This is a love void of any conditions to live up to. This is the kind of love Paul is encouraging husbands to have toward their wife, an unconditional, giving, compassionate care for your wife. In other words, I don't hold back with Krista in my relationship with her. I cannot give her these hoops that she has to jump through, all of these tasks that she has to knock off, and then I'm going to love her. That's conditional love. That's not the kind of love you give to your wife. That's not the kind of love I can give to my wife. I've got to give her unconditional love. And can I just say to you this morning, the agape love that is described in the Bible is not a love that you can even muster up in and of yourself. This is the love that is poured out in your hearts by the Holy Spirit. You can't love your wife right unless you are filled with the Spirit of God. But when you are empowered by the Spirit of God, His love flows from heaven's throne through your heart and gets all over your wife. That's the kind of love that you and I are charged to have towards our wives. One commentator says, it is agape, the love that was shown at Calvary, the love produced in the heart of the yielded saint by the Spirit, the love that will cause the husband to sacrifice himself and his own wishes in the interest of the well-being of the wife. So what does the scripture say? Husband, love your wives. Listen, don't jump over that phrase too quickly either. Love your wives. 
Matter of fact, let me say it to you again. Love your wife. This is what the Bible says. What are you getting at, Levi? Uh, Don't be trying to love somebody else's wife. That's what I'm getting at. Love your wife. So check it, men. If you have a wondering eye, you better get the grace of God on that thing quick before it ruins your marriage. And I'm not naive to think that there are some men who are in church today who have abandoned their wives and gone after another woman. Your wife may know about it, your wife may not know about it, but more importantly, can I say to you, God knows about it. Maybe the Lord brought you to church on purpose this morning because he wanted to rattle your cage a little bit and draw you back to himself so that you can be the husband that he saved you to be. Love your wife. There must be a special place in the heart of every husband of which only his wife takes a seat. And then Paul goes on to note, don't be embittered against them. Now, no doubt some men read these passages of Scripture, they get cocky about their position of leadership in the marriage. And as a result, they kind of barrel out their chest figuratively and sometimes literally and begin to exercise tyrannical authority over their wives. Some even use the verses that I have quoted this morning to point to their wives and say, see, this is how you should be living. Submit to me. And you're using that verse to beat your wife up. Look at the preacher. Stop it. Do not do that. Paul says, don't be embittered against them. This phrase is overwhelmingly interesting and extremely helpful for our Husbands today, it gives the imagery of leading with a sharp edge, causing someone to quake or to fear. It speaks of behaving harshly towards your spouse in word or deed. Uh, This describes a husband that may be living angrily, resentful, sarcastic, irritated, cynical, vicious, scornful, talking down to his wife, ragging his wife out, making her feel less than... The idea here is that the husband doesn't express discontent with his wife. You shouldn't live like she's a waste of space or like she's getting in your way. Don't show bitterness towards your wife. One commentator says, don't take advantage of your wife. Warren Wiersbe writes, husbands must be careful not to harbor ill will towards their wives because of something they did or did not do. A root of bitterness in a home can poison the marriage relationship and give Satan a foothold. The Christian husband and wife must be open and honest with each other and not hide their feelings or lie to one another. Look at the preacher eyeball to eyeball. Some of your marriages are on the rocks because of something that happened two, five, seven years ago. Put on humility. Put on forgiveness. Put on compassion. You say, well, Levi, where are you coming up with this? It's right there in Colossians chapter 3. Don't allow the enemy to disrupt your marriage by causing you to fall to the sin of bitterness. So if you're here today and you've got some issues with your wife, God brought you to church on purpose because you need to make those issues right. You need to ask God to forgive you and you need to ask your wife to forgive you. If you've been talking ugly to your wife, stop it. Ask your wife to forgive you. Ask the Lord to forgive you. And allow the Lord to bring you guys back together in harmony and unity in the marriage. Can I say something to you, eyeball to eyeball? Marriage is to be a picture of the gospel. It's a picture of Jesus in his relationship with the church. Marriage is an earthly stamp of a heavenly truth. And the enemy knows this. That's why the enemy will attack your marriage because if he can get your marriage split up, he can in some ways ruin the picture of Jesus and the church. So what's going on in your relationship? If you've got issues with your husband and you've got issues with your wife and you guys are bickering and fighting and hollering at each other all the time, can I say something to you? You are fighting the wrong battle. You don't wrestle against flesh and blood. 
You wrestle against the principalities of darkness who want to destroy your marriage, want to destroy my marriage. So you've got to make sure you're fighting the right fight. That you ask God by his grace this morning to cover you with his forgiveness. And then you ask your wife this morning, if need be, say, well, honey, I am so sorry. God got all over me in the church service this morning. I am convicted to the core. I've had an attitude problem. I've been talking to you in such a way that doesn't honor God. Forget. I've asked the Lord to forgive me. Now I'm asking you to forgive me. Could it be that God would bring you back together? Are y'all out there? <laughs> and then look at the preacher, eyeball to eyeball. How do, how do I say this so I can be like um, squared up in your face? Are y'all with me? If you are running around on your spouse, stop it. Come back to the Lord, come back to your spouse, honor God. That's the calling of the word. Man, let me remind you, apart from your relationship with Jesus, the greatest gift in your life is your wife. Listen to the proverb writer, and I'll read these, and men, you better say amen as loud as you can when I read them. Proverbs 18 and verse 22, he who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. Amen. Proverbs 19, that's right, they came alive on that one. You notice how quiet they were when I was reading those other ones, right? They were like, oh my word. Amen. Proverbs 19, 14, house and wealth are an inheritance from the fathers, but a prudent wife is from the Lord. Amen. Proverbs 31, 10, an excellent wife who can find? For her worth is far above jewels. Yeah. I've got a buddy um, who celebrated a wedding anniversary recently, and he put it online, kind of took a picture of Proverbs 31.10, and it said, an excellent wife, who can find? And out in the margin of his Bible, he wrote, I found one. <laughs> I wish I'd have done that. Maybe Krista hadn't seen it, and I can do it <laughs> this year. Krista and I have been married for um, it'll be 24 years in June. And uh, I, re I remember, look at y'all clapping. All right, come on. I know some of y'all have been married longer than that, just, just by how you look. Listen, I don't know why I say some things that I say, but anyway, so, but come back to me for just a second. When uh, Chris and I were engaged to be married, uh, I actually had a pastor um, growing up who did our marriage counseling. And it, it, was, it was pretty wild how this happened because uh, we lived out of town from him, and so we had to actually go to where he was, and he had to come to where we were. And so one of the nights, uh, I was preaching a revival in middle Georgia, and uh, he said, hey, Levi, I can come over to the revival. Uh, you know, I kind of go through the services with you, and then afterwards, uh, I can meet with you and Krista. We can do some premarital counseling. I said, that sounds great. So anyway, I get up and preach. And uh, once I'm finished preaching, we meet with the pastor and uh, kind of in one of those little Sunday school rooms in that church. And my wife was there, or my future wife, Krista. And he took out a poster board. It's kind of funny. He had all these little poster boards he kept pulling out. I guess he didn't <laughs> think I could pay attention without something visible and drawn. Are y'all with me? Maybe you've seen this before. There was a poster board that actually had a triangle on it. And here's what he did. He wrote at the top of that triangle, he wrote God. And then at the bottom left-hand side of that triangle, he wrote Levi, that's my name. And then at the bottom right hand of the triangle, he wrote Krista. And I said, okay, this is gonna be good. He's fixing to get somewhere with this. So then his name's Jimmy Corbett. And Jimmy said, um, Levi, when you are growing in your relationship with the Lord, you're getting closer to God. You're going in this direction on this triangle. Krista, when you grow in your relationship with the Lord, you're also, you're, you're moving up in that direction. And, and here's, here's the secret, he said, the secret sauce. 
He says, whenever you are growing, Krista, and Levi, you are growing closer to God, you actually are growing closer to one another. That's a good picture, isn't it? But then he inverts it and he said, but Levi, here's the reality too. If you, being on this point of the triangle, Krista, you being on this point of the triangle, if you start growing and walking away from the Lord, you start going further and further apart from each other. Y'all see the picture? And what I want to say to you this morning is the very best thing as a husband you can do for your wife is fall in love with Jesus. And wives, the very best thing that you can do for your husband is fall in love with Jesus. And as you are both growing in a relationship with one another or, or towards the Lord, you'll grow in your relationship with one another. That's what God desires for you. So here's what I would say to you this morning. You cannot grow in a relationship with the Lord unless you take that first step and come into a relationship with him. I shared the gospel with somebody, I uh, can't remember if it was this week or last week, but I asked the individual if they had a relationship with the Lord, and here, here was the response. I said, well, Levi, I'll tell you what, uh, I've known the Lord all my life. I said, really? What are you trying to say to me? He said, I was born Christian. <laughs> Just listen to some of y'all, y'all know that's not right. It's like, you're not born Christian. So just because your mom and dad may be followers of Jesus doesn't make you a follower of Jesus. Just because your grandparents are followers of Jesus doesn't make you a follower of Jesus. The Bible makes it so very plain that you have to come into a personal relationship with Jesus by putting your trust in him. Here's what the Bible teaches. You were created by God and for God. But what separates you from the Lord is your sin. We've all sinned and fallen short of God's perfect standard. John says in 1 John, if you say that you're without sin, you're a liar. And I would add, and that's a sin. We've all sinned and fallen short of God's perfect standard, and the payment for our sin is death and hell. That's what we deserve forever. But the great news, oh, please listen, is that God so desired to have a relationship with you that he sent his son Jesus to live a perfect life on your behalf and go to a cross and die death that you deserve. I deserve to die for my sin, you deserve to die for your sin, but Jesus died in our place. Can somebody say amen to that? All right. And then listen, he was buried, and then three days later he got up from the grave. Now had Jesus not been resurrected, what I'm saying to you is absolute hogwash. But if Jesus did get up from the grave, then what I'm saying to you is of absolute eternal importance. The Bible teaches that in order to come into a relationship with the Lord, and again, think of that triangle for just a moment, because some of you husbands, you're, you're, not even on the, you're not even on the triangle yet. Some of you wives, not on the triangle yet. In order to get on the triangle, you've got to admit that you're a sinner before a holy God. You've got to believe that Jesus died for you and got up from the grave. And you've got to surrender to him as Lord. He's got to be master. I don't know if you're a husband or a wife that needs to make that decision today, or if you're just a church member here today, or just kind of visiting, but you're like, Levi, I've never done that. Well, listen, I want to help you do that, and I want to help you do it right now. So what I want to do is just lead you in a prayer in just a few moments. And if you'd like to give your life to Jesus, you can pray along with me. So let's just do that together. Heads bowed or eyes closed. If you're here today and you say, Levi, man, I want to give my life to Christ this morning, maybe your husband, maybe your wife, maybe you're just here today and you just happen to show up on a day when we're talking about marriage. If you want to give your life to the Lord, can I encourage you right where you sit, just pray something like this as I pray out loud. Just say, Lord, I admit to you that I'm a sinner. And I believe Jesus died for me and got up from the grave. And the very best way that I know how, I'm turning from my sin this morning and I'm putting my trust in you. Now help me to be unashamed of my decision.